Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend and give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. They can support the Virtual Memories show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, last week's L.A. trip turned out to be even more frantic than I had planned. Um, but it went off just fine. I got to the hotel Monday with time to decompress from the near fatal lift ride from LAX, uh, did my panel Tuesday afternoon, managed to get to the airport early enough to catch a different red eye home. So I got to land at 430 in the morning instead of 7 a.m. Uh, Cheryl Crow was on that flight. Um, I did not pitch her on recording a podcast, although I did have my postcards with me. I just figured at that hour, nobody needs to hear from a schlub like me. Now, no travel this week, but a trade show in New York next week, where I'll also try and squeeze one or two episodes in. But this week, you get a conversation about, well, about the finitude of life and the potential for a fairer model of living. Now, I know that's broader than the, the or loftier than the, the subjects we usually get to, but my guest this time around has a new book called This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom, out now from Pantheon Books. His name is Martin Hagland, with an umlaut over the A in Hagland, not in Martin. This Life is an amazing book. It's it's an exploration of what makes life worth living, and it does that by asking us what it means to look at life without an afterlife and how we can live more fully by abandoning the notion that anything we lose will be restored to us in heaven or or that nirvana consists in, in utter detachment from the world. It's all about how you engage in the world through that, that well, why we should engage in the world through that, that finitude that defines who we are in time. And the first half of the book really dives into that notion. It uses philosophical and literary works to examine time, grief, anxiety about death and loss. Um, this is not some run-of-the-mill God is bad and people do awful things in the name of God argument about atheism, but a much more thought-out exploration of, of how we live in time and, and how we cheat ourselves and those we love by pinning our hopes on a, an eternal next world, one that we, we can't even conceive of uh, based on how we experience time. There's a really great segment on representations of time and memory in the works of, of Proust and Knausgaard that I, I really dug. I mentioned it in the episode that it might be the thing that finally gets me to read Knausgaard, who I have a unfair bias against. Now, the second half of the book explores how that mindset and that embracing affinitude can play out across the the social world. Um, Martin posits that this, I think he posits, he may counter my, my contention of this, that the post-eternal view of life that embraces finitude can lay the groundwork for a, a fairer, democratically socialist world, one that succeeds capitalism uh, into something that's, well, like I say, fairer. I know that sounds 
kind of weird or wish fulfillment-y uh, as a progression from uh, individual understanding of, of time and God into this. But but he uses a pretty neat Marx or Marxist critique of capital to, to demonstrate how capitalism's like understanding of time and value is inherently antithetical to, to living. Um, that is to use an argument I made somewhat recently, but in much cruder terms, uh, when talking about how my former college is about to go under and how my former grad school almost went under capitalism at its current extremes really warps all of us into well, away from being citizens and into being production and consumption units. And it really looks to maximize both of those seemingly without much of an equilibrium for what it means to to just live. Uh, so Martin goes into how that's baked into capitalism, that need to value um, what he refers to as socially necessary labor time instead of socially available free time, uh, which is what we all need to lead more fulfilling lives. I'm laying this stuff out really broadly, uh, and, and, and I'm not doing justice to the, the intricacy and fullness of his arguments, which really are worth a read. Uh, this life posits a world where our time is valued and, and valuable, and where being finite is seen as a feature and not a bug. I enjoyed it a lot, and partly that was because I was able to bust out some of the Hegel that I'd studied 25 years ago at St. John's College to, to inform the whole experience. Um, you don't have to have Hegel in your back pocket, uh, but I was awfully glad that it helped me during the book. And that's, that's sort of my point about the direction this world's going. I mean, could I have made better time or better use of my time from like 1993 to 95 by starting my career earlier, by skipping grad school. I went into trade magazine editing. Nothing from my St. John's College years explicitly prepared me for that gig. But those two years, man, they were pivotal in, in shaping who I am, who I am and in, in helping me learn how to learn, regardless of the subject matter, and to learn to read closely no matter what I'm reading or who I'm listening to. And those skills, I mean, yeah, there's there's a career benefit to them, but, uh, you know, they also just enhance the way I apprehend the world. They're not job tools. They're ways of, of approaching life. So what I mean is when we treat education as a means to maximize our pay or earning potential, we miss something important. Now, this life... It's a pretty significant book. I hope I'm, I'm getting that across. And it draws on a lot of sources to explore what it means to be alive in a world with others and to someday die. Um, that's an awful lot to cover in a single conversation. Martin does an admirable job of answering my not always on target questions. Now, as caveats go, we recorded in an office, Penguin Random House office, uh, near Central Park. So there's some car and truck noise. Also, I had to filter out the heating, which leads to some audio artifacts. Martin moved on and off the mic at various points. And finally, he's Swedish. He talks quickly sometimes. Um, but I hope you'll, you'll get what we're talking about. Now, here's Martin's bio from the flap copy of This Life. Martin Haglund is a professor of comparative literature and humanities at Yale University. A member of the Society of Fellows at Harvard University, he is the author of three highly acclaimed books, and his work has been translated into eight languages. In his native Sweden, he published his first book, Chronophobia, at the age of 25. His first book in English, Radical Atheism, was a subject of a conference at Cornell University and a colloquium at Oxford. His most recent book, Dying for Time, Proust, Wolf, Nabokov, was hailed by the Los Angeles Review of Books as a revolutionary achievement. He was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018. He lives in New York City, and his new book is This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Martin Hagelund. Where did the book begin for you? I mean, within the introduction, you talk about life in northern Sweden going back every year. But but for you, 
And, yeah. and the acknowledgement is also there isn't a strict, you know, this was the moment it began. Yeah, yeah. But where, uh, where did this life, this life, this <laughs> life start for you? Well, uh, well, the first thing I would say, I think that the questions that the book focuses on, in a way, I've been working on them my whole adult life in, in different registers. That's been the motivation for uh, uh, devoting my life to philosophy and literature in, in various ways. And, and I think from early on, really from my late teens, I mean, the, the, the sort of animating question for me is like, how, how should we think about our finitude? How should we understand our finitude? Uh, and like, simply, we could find our finitude in terms of like, you know, we're finite because, you know, we essentially depend on others and because we will die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm finite because I can't sustain my life on my own and uh, because my life will come to an end, you know. And uh, in the same way, like all the projects I'm engaged in, everything I'm trying to do, who I'm trying to be uh, is, is inherently fragile. It's something that can fall apart. And uh, really what I've turned to literature and philosophy, the reason I've turned to those discourses, those works, because to get resources to think through that question, how should we understand that? Everyone knows that we're fine in one sense, but how should we judge that fact? How should we see it? Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've argued in various ways in my previous work as well has been this, you know, there's a very dominant way of thinking about our finitude, which I call a religious understanding of finitude in this book, where, uh, where we understand that, like, where we think that the fact that we're finite is a lack, a fallen condition, somehow, like, if things were as they ought to be, if we yeah. had the best possible form of existence, we wouldn't be finite. Uh, uh, and that's, that's not an idea that's limited to traditional religion. You can have that view, and even if you don't think there's anything other than finitude, you can think, like, oh, but if only. Uh, we have the singularity among yeah. our, our, our tech brethren, yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are all yeah. sorts of versions of this idea where we think that, like, you know, the fact that we're finite testified there's something fundamentally wrong with us. We're lacking something. Uh, and what I wanted to argue instead is, is show in various ways that actually, even though it's painful and difficult to be finite, for sure, that that's also the condition of possibility for any form of spiritual life, any form of meaning, any form of care, any form of mattering. Uh, and I had, written, I had pursued that thought in various ways in my previous work, in, published by academic presses, but I was very moved by how many readers would contact me who normally wouldn't read such books and were very taken with this basic idea. So that's where this book started. Can I write, can I pursue this idea? Uh, not dumbing it down, but deepening it even more, but in a register that would speak to even more people. That was a long answer, sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. I once had a guest go 40 minutes on okay. the question of, you know, what drew you to this subject? Oh, yeah, and you I'm never sorry. actually answered the sorry. question. So that's, so that's like, okay. Uh, no, because, again, it, time yeah. is finite, but, you know, our time can be open at Yeah, yeah, but that's I don't okay. want to <laughs> suck up all the air in the room. No, that's so, okay. yeah. Um, that's just throwing out something. Too. Well, well yeah. it actually is of a piece with the introduction that, again, seems very... Um, I'd say accessible in a lot of ways, but I kept thinking there's this undertrend of the only Hegel I've ever read, which yes. is the elements of the philosophy of right. Yeah, yeah. And in, in the last paragraph or two, you get yeah. to Hegel. I'm like, oh, thank God. Okay, I wasn't yeah. misunderstanding this. No, this no, is you're actually underlying right. the whole you're absolutely right. But I can also understand why you don't dump Hegel at the very beginning yeah, on, on a absolutely. potentially popular audience. Yeah. So, um, but that sense of finitude. Yeah. Was there a was there some early experience? of death or, you know, around death that, that mattered to you like that? Or is it simply something you, you grasped intuitively, you know, and, and kind of worked on intellectualizing? Well, I mean, I think we all in various ways uh, have very concrete and palpable experience of finitude from, from early on. I think for me, uh, I mean, I had the good fortune of uh, being very close to my grandparents, you know, and getting to experience the generational life in that way, which I think is very important. And, uh, both, uh, yeah, and, and, and my maternal grandmother is still alive, but the other three uh, died, uh, you know, in my early childhood, early teens. And, 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 and those experiences, I think, of like uh, seeing these uh, uh, older father and mother figures for me, uh, who I love very deeply, and, and seeing the sort of uh, vulnerability and anxiety uh, uh, of them in the face of death, but also between my uh, paternal grandparents, like, you know, my, my paternal grandfather took care of my maternal grandmother who had very severe Alzheimer's, and, and just seeing that sort of uh, 
faith and resoluteness in terms of sustaining a commitment, even in the face of like complete loss, was very. I think I didn't put it that way to myself. No, the no, time, yeah, but that's things you knew intuitively. Yeah, yeah exactly. What you exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. precisely, and, and very much I, I think of philosophical and literary work very much as to sort of making explicit what is implicit in experience like that that we all have, and like how can we do justice to them? Uh, how can we render their pathos and their significance? Um, so. Uh, then there were like breakups and whatever. No, no. Yeah, well, there, yeah. there are also the fi minor finitudes that you go through yeah. that, 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 uh, uh, but once I realized how everything around when I was 16, 17, that like, if you were lucky enough, you could actually devote your life to writing and reading and talking and teaching these sorts of issues, then like, well, I'm going to try to do everything I do can to, to be able to do that. So. Mm -hmm. uh, again, when you bring up the finitudes, it, it puts me in mind yeah. of the Knausgaard chapter that yeah. you have, or the Knausgaard segment that, that you have in here, and all those little things that we end up losing over, uh, yeah. over our sordid youth, I, I suppose. Uh, yeah. I do have to give you uh, uh, lots of praise for really justifying anxiety, which is my... Right. steady state uh, as far as existence goes. So I was very happy to see someone, you know, within the span of 400 pages justify the fact that I'm just in a constant state of, of buzz like this. But, yeah. um, but can you talk a bit about, well, just say the, the thesis beyond, um, as you put it, uh, escaping that religious faith and moving into to a secular one, and then what that means, what we'll say collectively, but what that means, you know, in terms of humanity. Right, right, right. I'll, so, so I have to keep my answer. I'll answer the first part of that question, and then you can follow up so that there's some sure. dialogue here, so I'm not just going on and on. Uh, no, I mean, so, you know, part, part of pursuing that thought, then, like, okay, that our finitude is itself not a lack or a restriction by the condition of possibility. One way of thinking about that, and one way I'm thinking about it in the book, is to think that. Everything we believe in, everything we're devoted to, is something that is a form of life or a project that that can fall apart that we have to sustain. You know, and and it's that dynamic that I'm calling uh, secular faith. You know, secular faith is uh, the dynamic of secular faith is that you know the the object of faith, whatever you believe in, is dependent on the practice of faith. You know, so. If we were married, we're not, and I'm not going to propose it's now. It's legal. But, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but if we were married, I mean, then like, you know, our marriage and our love doesn't exist by itself. It only exists insofar as we sustain it through our practical commitment to being together. Mm -hmm. And built into that is uh, a faith in the intrinsic value and importance of sustaining that. You know, so, so, uh, so that's the, fir the first aspect of secular faith. But going along with that is the sense that like, uh, then that object we care about or that project we care about is fragile. It's part of what animates our commitment to it. Because if we didn't, uh, the fact that it can fall apart if we don't sustain it, it's not just a negative threat. It's also the, what positively animates mm -hmm. uh, uh, and motivates us to, to, to try to be faithful to that project as well. So that's, 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 uh, that's one way into the... But, that, but, but the idea is that, so in one sense, it's like all forms of faith are secular in my in my setting on, on one level because like anything you're devoted to anything you believe in as an end in itself anything in light of which you lead your life uh you know you both have to believe in its value and importance but you also have to believe that it's uh fragile because otherwise you know there would be no reason to care about it so in practical terms we all have secular faith uh but then What's distinctive about what I'm calling religious faith is the idea that there's a special object of faith, you know, uh, that unlike all these other objects of faith, all these other projects, is ultimately independent of the practice of faith and uh, separable from the practice of faith. So, like, you know, if you believe in eternity or nirvana or God, etc., it's not like the existence of God depends on us believing in him. Uh, so, so that idea that the, and that the highest object of faith would be one that like itself is not fragile and itself doesn't depend on our practical activity. That's, that's what I'm trying to like, that idea is what I want us to let go of. So as to like fully recognize and avow the importance of pursuing, uh, the commitments that pertain to our life together. Well, I think you phrase it in terms yeah. of, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the various people and things in our lives are ends in themselves. Yeah. In, in, yeah. The secular view, but yeah. in the religious one, everything is simply a mean, not simply, yeah. but everything is a means towards achieving that ultimate end. Oh. Um, and this is, again, a way of, of removing that sense of, of people simply or things simply being the, the means to something else. Yeah, absolutely. 
the one quibble I had yeah. in that that, yeah. that first half of the book where yeah. you discuss, you know, again, moving beyond uh, religious faith into this, this secular notion. Yeah. You frame it in terms of the redemption, in terms of eternity, or uh, uh, that nirvana sense of, of disata- detachment, etc. Yeah. The flip side of it is hell and the eternal yeah. punishment aspect yeah. of it. And that's the one thing I, I didn't really see in, in here. That, yeah. uh, while we all have the, you know, we're raised with the, you know, you will go to heaven, etc. Yeah. There's also the implicit threat of if you don't do this, you right. know, the, the worst thing in the world happens. So. Right. Yeah, you know, that, I was wondering whether that was also playing into the um, again the, the existential framework you build for right, for this right. or not. Or, well, I'm really glad you're um, um, you're asking me that because it allows me to to say something about the general strategy of the book. The yeah. reason I don't criticize religion on those terms is because that's. First of all, it's much easier and has been done much more. Sure. Uh, yeah. Say like, well, you know, these religious ideas of the afterlife are really bad because they are these coercive threats of punishment and hell, and that's really bad. And uh, I agree that that's bad, yeah. but that that that's uh, beside the point. Essentially. Yeah, because the, because the, the again because the intuition I'm after it's not like um, it's not primarily even to disprove the existence of eternal life or an afterlife. It's just a deeper question to show why. It's not even in principle desirable. Even the best reward. Yeah, is not exactly. The, yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. And and yeah. and and that's because that's the only way you can disclose why the fact that uh, things are finite and fragile is part of why they matter. Then you have to show, like, well, um, inversely, that means that like uh, uh, a state of being in which uh, there could be no pain and suffering, in which there could be no loss. You know, nothing could also be at stake. Sure. There would be nothing to be anxious about, but for the same reason, there would be nothing to be passionate about. Yeah. Uh, and those two things go together. You know, you can't have uh, the positive without the negative in that sense. And that's and and yeah, and that's the sort of logic that I'm trying to make vivid in various ways in the book. Mm-hmm. It reminded me in part of um, my favorite Orwell essay because yeah. I'm a Orwell freak. On yeah. the, the essay said yeah. "Inside the Whale," the one he, yeah. he writes about Henry Miller right. ostensibly, but really about English letters from 1900 to 1940 yeah. and talks about the communist writers who come after the modernists yeah. and how the modernists essentially blew up every belief system you could have, right. but they didn't blow up the need to believe right. and that the communist writers following after uh, communist in Orwell's light, like mm. Spender, Auden, et cetera, yeah. uh, day Lewis, um, essentially transposed an almost Catholic theology onto what was essentially Europe in the, the 30s into the right, 40s, right. Uh, transposing uh, hell as Berlin, heaven as Moscow, and, and you know, Stalin as, as God, right, Hitler as the right, devil. Right, yeah. um, but what he says is, you know, you can get rid of the belief systems, but it's very difficult to get rid of the need to believe. Right. Do you think, do you think that's ultimately inherent in man in that respect? Or is the sense of belief something that's that's mutable to the point at which, you know, it can be turned into you know, our finite lives and, and right. finding the value in those. Well, one has to be careful about what one needs means by the phrase, the need to believe. Yeah. If that means we need to believe in uh, something uh, eternal, immutable, uh, then I don't think we need to believe in that sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but but uh, a strategy that... Uh, one of the sort of ways of thinking about this that I'm arguing against in the book is, is to think that, like, well, the paradigm for belief and faith is religious faith, mm-hmm. uh, and if we debunk, and, and the point of debunking that is then to like face up to an existence, you know, void of faith or belief, you know. Whereas I'm trying to show that like the deeper dynamic of faith is better captured by what I'm calling secular faith, mm-hmm. uh, and that's actually the faith that, in practical terms. Uh, animates uh, even those who identify as as, as religious, you know, uh, um, and, uh, and this is again. I mean, this is why, why Hegel is important, that because Hegel's idea was that, like, actually, in in faith as a practical activity, the real uh, object of devotion is the congregation itself, is the community you build through recognizing one another's uh, dignity and intrinsic value in 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 various forms of practices surrounding birth and death and coming together and so on. But that the religious understanding of that activity doesn't grasp its own truth because it thinks like, well, the ultimate object of devotion is like a salvation that goes beyond this fragile life that we share or its obedience uh, to a God who commands norms external to the ones we legislate to ourselves. 
But in fact, what we're always doing is uh, we are trying to lead a life together and, and you know, a life shared by uh, fragile material embodied beings is the highest good. And, you know, the real striving has to do with like making that life flourish as deeply as possible. Uh, and part of, for Hegel, overcoming the religious understanding of that type of activity and having the right philosophical understanding of it is coming to recognize that, that like we are the ultimate purpose and the highest good is our life together. And see, that's a very different critique of religion. It's, 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 like, it's one that like, uh, instead of saying, um, uh, you have this coherent belief that, and these practices that I disavow and that you should just like learn to uh, get on without. You're saying that like, actually th there's a uh, inviting people to ask themselves whether, you know, they actually take the highest good to be a life beyond fragility or whether the highest good is in the life we can achieve together. And the more we practically recognize that in, in the way we lead our lives together, the, the, the more we can do justice to that. And that leads to the second half of the book, yeah, where yes. this adoption of secular faith leads to well, leads to democratic socialism. Yeah. But let's let's get to the you know that arc and yeah. both how you define that and what that progression is, and how you right. move from Hegel to Marx to uh, revaluing the entire notion of uh, yeah, yeah. value and labor yeah, in yeah. the world, which, yeah. which is a lot further than I thought this book was going to go when I started it. But. Yeah, but it's a lot further than I thought that the book was going to go too when I started it. I have to say, uh, it's just that. Uh, the, it turned out to demand that. Uh, we do was, talk about teleology in the book, so yeah. Yes, it, it, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Very important, though. I mean, that teleology does not mean causal necessity. This is what one often thinks that, like, Hegel and other people are teleological things. It's like, well, he thought it's just like, this automatically is going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about causal necessity. We're talking about rational necessity. We're talking about, like, if we are committed to these principles, what does that demand of us to achieve, to do justice to them? That's, that's the purpose built into those commitments. But it doesn't mean that it's secure that they're going to be achieved historically. Mm -hmm. Just as like the, the sort of political project and emancipation that I envisage in the book, it's not secured by any way. And if it was, well, we wouldn't have to work at it. So, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm with uh, you. That's, that's part of the, what you're trying to get at in the exactly, course of this, exactly. this book and the question of, you know, how to achieve it. That's exactly, right. exactly. But so just to back up and actually uh, yeah. answer a little more step by step the way you post the question, because like it's very important that uh, it's not a straight road from secular faith to democratic socialism, political emancipation, uh, because secular faith on the most fundamental level, that's just the dynamic of caring about anything at all. Uh, now, what's really important is the other central concept in the book, in the subtitle, is spiritual freedom. Um, and here, like, you know, this is another Hegelian thought in the book, that like really the, the modern commitment to freedom, that historical achievement that, that we came to hold, at least in the abstract, at least as a principle, uh, um, the intrinsic value of each individual as an end in him or herself, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of freedom and equality as the norm to which we hold ourselves. Uh, I mean, that's, that, you know, that's a specific historical achievement that, that and, and, and the other que another question is like, for us to uh, fulfill the promise of that commitment, what does that demand of us uh, in practice uh, as a society? Uh, and it's really from that that I derive the necessity and the principles of democratic socialism. So, they, so they're not like this, like a historically, just because oh, this is the structure of care and this is how we believe. It, it's 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 a more complicated story than that. So, um, um, yeah, but maybe it would be helpful to say a little bit more <laughs> about what I mean by spiritual freedom before. Sure. Before, yeah. Um, so another major strand of the book uh, is, is to show them that like spirit, any form of spiritual life actually has to be finite again we easily tend to think of the highest form of spiritual life would be some sort of contemplative eternal peaceful state whereas like in fact i'm trying to show that like you know only a being who is finite and anxious about their finitude can lead a spiritual life in the first place because uh spiritual life and spiritual freedom requires the ability to ask yourself what is worth doing with your time what you ought to do you know and that question has to be alive in you if it was just like given who you ought to be and what you ought to do, you know, you wouldn't be free in any relevant sense, you know? So like all other forms of freedom presuppose your ability to 
uh, engage not just theoretically but practically with the question of like you know not just what you ought to do but ought I to do what I supposedly ought to do what is worth doing with my time what is worth prioritizing so you cannot so you know you have to be able to ask yourself um, those fundamental questions of uh, value like what uh, and those are always questions like what is worth devoting my time to uh, what should I prioritize and again that's a, that's a question that can only have a grip on you if you understand yourself to be finite, that you don't have forever to do anything and be anyone, you know, if, if you really thought your life would last forever or that you were in an internal state, you know, the, there would be no urgency in asking yourself that question. Like, what ought I to do? What should I prioritize? Uh, what should I devote myself to? You know, it would be nothing at stake in that devotion. Uh, part of what's so moving when someone decides to share their life with you is that they like, you know, uh, I can't do anything and everything, and, and like I, I make you a priority. But you can only express that if you take yourself to be like have a precious, finite time yeah. to, to give someone. So, so that's a sort of general condition of, of spiritual freedom. But then, like the political question is, is uh, how must our life together be organized such that we both individually and collectively can own that question of our priorities, can own the question of of what is worth doing, what is not worth doing. Uh, and, uh, and that's where all the political questions come in. Which yeah. leads to a radical reading of Marx and everyone who comes after him, pretty much, uh, yeah. in, in terms yeah. of understanding <laughs> yeah. what labor is. And, and yeah. This um, is the point when the listeners start thinking, this sounds really crazy now. How can well, you do all of this? But it works so <laughs> step by step. That, that, that's my question. Yeah. How, yeah. how do you see that yeah. um, intertwining, I suppose, the, the, the first half of the book and the second half of the book, where you, again, the first half establish you know, on a, a personal basis, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Uh, what this means, and then what that comes to mean, how that, you know, dovetails with how we understand or re-understand capitalism and yeah. how we're, you know, how we're understood by a system and how that needs to be. Yeah. Are those inevitable? I suppose our secular faith and spiritual freedom, as you work them out in the course yeah. of the book, yeah. uh, inevitably intertwined. Yeah, they are. I mean, for a number of reasons. So, like, the first thing I'm going to say in a very broad way, one thing I'm trying to show throughout the book but becomes explicit in the second half is that uh, we, we can't actually separate existential from economical questions and mm -hmm. we can't separate spiritual from material questions. We can distinguish them. They're not the same thing, but we can't separate them. And, and uh, as always, finitude is the reason. <laughs> uh, uh, because, I mean... Uh, you know, because like why there is even a question of economy in the first place. I mean, there can only be a question of economy for uh, a being who can treat her life and what she does as a matter of what she values. Mm -hmm. That is to say, as a question of priorities. Uh, uh, and that's an economical question in the most fundamental sense. You know, like there's no economical problem for God. Because, you know, if you have infinite, infinite time, yeah. you know, there's no question of how to prioritize, how to economize, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you know, uh, so, so the first thing I want to say is that economical questions, it's very distorting to think that they uh, primarily or exclusively pertain to what we now call economics. I mean, like, uh, so, 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 so all existential questions are, are economic in the sense that they're a question of, like, what you value, what you prioritize, all those things. Similarly, like, because... If, if a condition of spiritual life is that you're fragile, that you're vulnerable, that you're materially embodied, then all the material questions of how we produce and reproduce our lives are also inseparable from like who we can be and what we can do. So you remember I said in the beginning, one aspect of finitude is that like I can't maintain my life on my own. I'm essentially dependent on others. And if that's the case, then like you know, that doesn't pertain just when you're an infant and you have to be taken care of to, like, survive at all. Like, in all our daily lives, the condition for us to do anything is that, like, there are all of these other people working and enabling that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and it's to grapple with, uh, with that and saying that we can't think about what our commitments are, whether as individuals or as a society, without thinking about that global question of how our lives are sustained materially and economically. Yeah. Which leads to democratic socialism. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. So, a couple of things that are important to, to say about how I uh, read Marx and how I read critique of uh, capitalism is that it's very important to understand that it's an imminent, what, what 
philosophically is called an imminent critique of both liberalism and capitalism. That is to say, like Marx, in important ways, thinks that like the sort of emancipation that he's calling for, even though it requires the overcoming of capitalism, uh, you know, the, 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 the capitalism itself is a form of progress in the sense that like uh, when we move from a society that, in some ways, uh, condones slave labor. You know, where like part of our, our lives is, is are sustained is because there are certain people whose time is not recognized as having any value at all. That's what it is to be a slave. You know, you're you're, you're owned by someone else. You know, so so you you're you're denied recognition that your time has intrinsic value, uh, and like. As Marx points out, wage labor is actually the first social form in human history uh, that, in principle, recognizes uh, the intrinsic value of everyone's time. Mm. Uh, you know, because like you have to pay someone to do something. Right. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we think wage labor is good, uh, but like, but but it is progress compared to a, to a society where there are certain people who whose the, the value of whose time is not recognized at all. And then, the, and again. Part of the critique of capitalism showing that, like, as long as we then uh, regulate our lives through that form of labor, we, there are going to be all sorts of internal contradictions in the system that leads to systematic unemployment, crises, all of these things. And uh, and it's by light of our own commitments that we've achieved through liberalism and capitalism that actually demands uh, that degree of, of yeah and, and, yeah and, and reorganizing how we how we. Uh, um, uh, how we reproduce our lives, but I mean, I can. Um, uh, well, I mean, you yeah. you, you bring yeah. it within the book. You 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 establish it as a critique that ultimately capitalism, in and of itself, is always going to. It's going to value the what was it the socially necessary labor time yeah. versus socially available free time, which is right. what you think we should be right. valuing more effectively. Yeah, um, you know, to to create a better world. Yeah. Um, and by an imminent critique, uh, for my dumbass yeah. terminology, yeah. it's it's inherent within the nature of the the thing itself. In right. Other words, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, and that has to do with like I mean, just to say a few things about this. Obviously, this yeah, is please. a big topic. Uh, you know, it's very complex. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> but but you know, I shouldn't I shouldn't. Um, uh, no spoilers. But. <laughs> step away from the challenge. So I'll say just a few things. I mean, like sure. one thing that like. You know, what it means that when we produce value through the social form of wage labor, that means that, like, you know, actually just through the practice, uh, value is measured in terms of labor time. You can, you can make something cheaper to produce by reducing how much time it costs to produce it. That's, for example, why we use machines instead, et cetera. Uh, but you see, like, that idea of, of that, that, that sort of labor we do as a means to an end, that, that counts as a as cost. That's only because we value actually having time to lead our lives. That's what I'm calling socially available free time. Uh, but under capitalism, because of the social organization, we actually can't make that our uh, collectively embraced value because that, that's not recognized as having any value in itself. You know, like when I, when we, uh, you know, no, when a yeah. guy takes time off from work to yeah. make a podcast that doesn't yeah. have any commercial aspect to it, but you know, that's, yeah, absolutely, that's, absolutely, yeah. and and yeah, so, so so it's both that and also that like, uh, you know, things that should be liberating and emancipating. For example, when we have technological innovations in in labor, you know, that's also then felt as like unemployment and immiseration mm -hmm. by the workers who then are displaced. Uh, are, yeah. are displaced. Yeah. Uh, all those sorts of contradictions. And I'm trying to think through, you know, not in a sort of blueprint way, but on a level of principles, like both what the systematic contradictions are, how we should understand them, and what would it require of us to organize our society in such a way that we were no longer subject to those contradictions. That's really like the project of the second half. Did you pass the book along to Yale Econ people or, or not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, like, I, I've had, so, so one part of it is so that I'm also engaging sort of like neoclassical economics. And yeah, that's what I was sort of wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah this whole economic <laughs> paradigm that, that, that I'm wrongly in one has thought discredits Marx. So it's been actually very productive to, for me to, to have to argue with uh, people who are very entrenched in that paradigm. So that's certainly sharpened a number of the arguments mm -hmm. on that level. I mean, I hadn't expected that that, that, the economical arguments would, would end up being so detailed. But again, it was just a matter of following what the thought itself demands. So if you're really going to think about the relation between time and value, you know, one thing you're ending up in is like economics, but not economics in our modern 
sense where like you cannot you know the economy is thought as something separate from the rest of society whose laws we can study mm -hmm. no but it's becoming understood as like intrinsic to social relations intrinsic yeah. to spiritual life itself and that it's very distorting the way modern economics like seals off economics as a system of laws and with its own dynamic and not understanding that like we have to understand that as a social phenomenon mm -hmm. so. what was the toughest part of the book for you in terms of writing and, and maybe even in terms of conceptually grappling? Well, I think the hardest thing uh, on a sort of personal level was uh, when I really started working very deeply on Marx, which really makes you think about uh, all these things you prefer to make invisible in your daily life, you know, mm -hmm. how is my a life actually sustained, you know, what sort of labor practices globally make possible everything I do every day? Uh, that's a very painful and difficult thing to be cognizant of. Alongside then also like uh, thinking through what it would be meant to actually transform that. Uh, and, you know, in the book, I'm um, very strident about both uh, why we are implicitly committed to overcoming this social form of life that we call capitalism. And also like, here are the principles uh, uh, that we could avow and uh, and that it is possible, but it's also like extraordinarily difficult. So, so I think that like that both the sort of intense awareness of um, the social relations in which I'm embedded uh, and both the need to and the difficulty of overcoming that. I mean, that just became... Uh, a sort of how far am I going to take this? No, thing? No, not, so, or, not so much. Not so I knew exactly... No, or just... The difficulty the, is more on the level of just like... Uh, uh, I mean, the arguments themselves were challenging to work out, but there was this other element of just, uh, yeah, how painful it can be to really try to reckon with uh, the yeah. alienated form of life under which we live and, 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 and what it would require to overcome it and how, uh, what, what deep and difficult changes that would require. I mean, so, so, so even though lots of people have told me that they're struck by it, like... Uh, how hopeful the book is. I mean, I would say less hopeful than it's, it's try to really insist on, on our commitments and what is possible, you know, but, um, and, and wants, wants, to, wants to really think, uh, yeah, on the level of possibility, but then, yeah, but then the, 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 the real challenges um, in, terms, in terms of actual change, I mean, that, that, that just weighed on me a lot in the last mm -hmm. half of the book. So. Do you do a lot of Non-professional or or what? Okay, I'm going to put it in, yeah. in a way that's going to sound terrible. Yeah. What are you doing to advance the cause besides the book itself? Well, so I mean, uh, this is a question I get often. I mean, one th the first thing I want to say about it, and I say that in the conclusion, is that like I think it's a mistake to divide theoretical and practical activity that way. I see like my teaching, my writing, all of these things are integral sure. to a sort of emancipatory project because because. If one truly thinks you can't separate theory and practice, then like how we think about ourselves, how we conceptualize ourselves, is also part of how we actually practically uh, understand ourselves. So like, uh, yeah. So, so I see the book itself as being, uh, I mean, modest, but still a part of. Oh yeah, no, I'm not devaluing that. About. I just yeah, wasn't yeah. sure. If yeah, so, other, you know, uh, curricular activity like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I've been, uh, you know, both in Sweden here, I've been engaged in in in, uh, in various forms of organizing as well. You know. Uh, but the the sort of uh, um, and I had been looking for a long time to to for for a long time I, I was as very in previous work uh, I had more of a division there and insisted on like I didn't want to make any facile sort of political justifications for my philosophical work. But mm -hmm. one of the things this book really allowed me to do is that uh, develop what I think is the right way of thinking about the relation between philosophy and practice and philosophy and political commitment that mm -hmm. way. What struck you weirdest about America when you came here? Or what continues to strike you as, wow, I do not understand how a system evolved quite like this. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess... There's always the gun thing. Everybody falls back on the yeah, gun thing. But Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I think, and actually, you know, we haven't talked about this at all, but the very idea of America is, is very important for the conclusion, which is very much about the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King and these things. Um, I mean, I guess the, the thing that continues to fascinate me most about the United States is that there is, th this is a nation uh, founded on the idea of freedom 
uh, and that and the authority of that idea, you know, everyone recognizes regardless of what your position is. Uh, that means something very different for all these uh, all these different people. But but it's a very uh, uh, that's a that's a very uh, I mean in terms of the imminent critique we talked about before is that like you know if you're going to criticize something you have to start from uh, what people are already committed to and and show why there are contradictions in how they think they can be faithful to that commitment and what it demands of them so uh, even though the US is painfully far away from an actual free society I, I think that like the fact that it's founded on an idea of freedom and that that idea in however abstract and formal form has authority provides these uh, resources for imminent critique uh, that um, you know that I've become more sensitive to precisely because I'm living here you know uh, um, so are there things you have to explain when you go home when you go back to, to Sweden I mean or visits are there things that people ask why do they yeah, you know, there are certainly many things, but like, I, I, one thing I'm trying to avoid, though, that a lot of my European friends who live in America have, you know, is this like, I mean, there's a very established European way of complaining about the United States yeah. uh, that, you know, like that has a lot of uh, social cultural capital, but I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to engage in that. I mean, I have a lot of very severe critiques of, of contemporary life in the United States, but but I sort of don't want to play the the European cultural card. You know, I'm trying to very seriously uh, engage with uh, the society where I've chosen to, to to lead my life. So 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 I, I um, yeah. So, so I'm gonna. Um, defer. Yeah, I'm going to defer on that question because uh, also well, many people are already doing that. Well, let me ask you, in that yeah. case, you mentioned the country being founded on freedom. It's, yeah. it's a thing that comes up, I think, when you have the, the section on Hayek yeah. in the book, yeah, yeah. the yeah, yeah. conflation of freedom and liberty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which are two different things yes. in, in yes. some respects. Can you go into that a little? Yeah, absolutely, of, absolutely. And, I've, you know, uh, and that's... Yeah, and it's very important that I don't really talk about freedom of choice in that way, you know, which is very... Uh, so, so because Hayek has a very... Even though Hayek is, of course, European rather than American, but, but he has a very uh, classical and rigorous certain version of, of, of idea of liberty where, like, you know, you are free as long as you're not directly coerced in making your cho choices, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, th you know, th that counts as not free, whereas, like... The deeper question of freedom I'm interested in is like, you know, what are the collective decisions and collective forms of life that in advance, you know, constrain and shape what, uh, you know, what we can choose between, what we can take up as valuable, how we can engage that question of our priorities. And it's really like, you know, for us to be free, both individually and collectively, has to do with like we have to be able to be part of uh, not just... Uh, making a set of formally un uncoerced choices within a very restricted paradigm, you know, I can buy this or I can buy that. Uh, it's rather about uh, 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 being able to engage in a fundamental question of like, uh, you know, what is worth prioritizing, what is worth valuing. Uh, and that can't simply be, I mean, because Hayek thinks about it as like, you know, as long as there's no collective that sort of constrains or coerces the individual, then the individual is this discrete unit uh, who just should have freedom to make his or her choices. But what that disregards is the fact that, like, it doesn't ask the question, what does it mean to be an individual? What does it mean to be an agent? And one of the things that means to be an individual, means to be an agent, is that uh, I can't try to do anything. I can't try to be anyone without what I in the book call a practical identity. You know, that's like, you know, uh, you say, I'm, uh, you know, I want to lead my life as a professor or as a citizen, all of those things. And, like, you know, I can take up and identify with that practical identity as an end in itself, as something in light of which I lead my life. But, you know, what it means to be a citizen, to be a professor, any, any of those social roles, like, they are, that's from the beginning socially constituted in a way so that there's, there's, no, st there's, there's no position where, like, the individual just uh, uh, freely... Uh, yeah, I realize yeah, this is yeah. an inversion of my question about yeah. hell. Yeah, yeah. That, that for yeah. Hayek, it's it's the flip side of that is the you know just seeing yourself as able to act without thinking of all of the the instrumentation behind you yeah. and everything. It's okay. That, that's yeah, gonna, yeah, I get to learn yeah. something this time too. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So like, uh, 
Yeah. Do you have a religious upbringing? Uh, I was uh, raised. Uh, yeah, I mean, like my 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 family comes out of sort of like Protestant Christianity. Uh, so and uh, so I was so I was so I was raised in church actually. Uh, but unlike I think a lot of people who are that and then subsequently uh, become atheists, for me. Um, the religious parts of them never had uh, had any had any existential grip on me. I mean, I never, uh, even though socially I participated in, in, uh, in like yeah, I, I, I was never believe, yeah yeah I was never uh, a believer in that way. So that also means that like, uh, and, and when I came to take my distance from it, it was not. This goes back to the health question, not because like, well, look, this institution is corrupt uh, or it doesn't live up to its own morals. All of these things that a lot of people. Which are legitimate complaints, you know. Uh, for me, it was rather when I really started thinking about these existential questions, um, it was even bracketing all of those problems with the church as an institution. It was rather like, well, uh, the more fundamental assumptions about what is desirable, what is the highest good, what is commitment. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like there were the resources there to do justice to what that actually is, and that's that's what led me to. Uh, Philosophy instead of religion, as it were, um, for those resources. But um, so you're always the weird kid growing up. In other words, that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, look, I mean, I, yeah, I, and I, I was like, I, uh, um, uh, I was interested in Bible exegesis, but for philosophical reasons, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so like, as as ways of like trying to articulate to ourselves, like who we are and what matters to us, you know, that's... Well, uh, and another spoiler yeah, alert, yeah. I mean, you have the, the section primarily on Kierkegaard yeah. about Abraham and Isaac, that's yeah. uh, exegesis at the wazoo. You, you really, you know, go into that, what it means and what the, the various conceptions of, of you know... Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and as long as we're doing trailers, I guess, like, the, another important feature of the book is that, like, a big, big question in the book is, like, how we should understand the uh, birth and death of Jesus, as it were, the incarnation and the crucifixion, and... Uh, I, I, I distinguish between a religious and a secular reading of of that. So that's that's also a big. Uh, it's another thing that interested Hegel that 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 uh, the way of transposing God, Christ, exactly. and, and Holy Spirit as three aspects of, of state and our participation in it. Absolutely, but also how we should think about like what does it mean that like through the idea of the incarnation and the crucifixion, the idea of the birth and the death of Jesus, that we came to think of. Uh, uh, God or the divine as something that is born and can die, mm -hmm. you know, like from a um, from what I in the book call a religious standpoint, that's still just an intermediary stage that God descends into mortal life and then ascends from it. But the the Hegel inspired reading of it that I that I advocate instead it's that like it paves the way for recognition that actually like another way of understanding the necessity of incarnation in mortal material life is to say like that's actually like any possible spiritual life must be uh, fragile and materially embodied and mortal to matter in the first place. And, and uh, when we take one step further, then we, we can recognize that like um, that uh, the object of faith isn't necessarily incarnated, not because it's a transcendent God that decides to take on human form, but because what we are devoted to, namely our life together, is something that is what it is only through the way we sustain it, always in relation to its possible dissolution. And so there are all sorts of resources, again, imminent to that, uh, to, 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 to thinking about the incarnation, to, to come to recognize uh, uh, what I'm calling the secular character of our faith and our commitment. Your folks happy with the... With your career path and the book, uh, yeah, I mean, I think they've they've uh, uh, by now they are. Uh, I mean, I think uh, early on, uh, how was he going to make a living? I don't yeah, know. exactly. That was That's a big, my, that, my Jewish mother. Yeah, impression no, that was a big, stuff. big question. That was a big, it's not limited to to that context. It certainly, it certainly was a question here too. I mean, uh, my father thought I should be an engineer or something, and like, and and, and uh, but. Uh, but now, when it's turned out to be actually viable, <laughs> then, then they're happy for my sake. And, and um, so uh, I'm grateful for that. And are you happy with the book? If there was another chapter that you could add, what would it entail? Um, Which is a way of asking, what did you have to cut that you really wish you could have kept in there? Yeah, actually, I mean, one of the things that I'm really happy about with this book is that, like, I do feel... Uh, 
very happy with it that in the sense that like I, I mean of course there are always things you can elaborate further and I hope to have the chance to do that in various uh, discussions and debates surrounding the book but but what was really important is that like I got to write this long conclusion um, which is about Martin Luther King and Hegel and that I think makes in very narrative and dramatically concrete terms a lot of the stakes of the book come together there so I feel like uh, one thing I'm hoping is that when people read it that they make sure to read the conclusion because I think one can have a lot of the full implications of many of the arguments uh, are only I mean the book is really constructed as 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 an arc mm -hmm. and, and the full stakes of the distinction between secular and religious faith the full stakes of spiritual freedom uh, the full stakes of the difference between capitalism and, and democratic socialism really uh, only come together in the conclusion. So if I hadn't written the conclusion, I would have, but once yeah. and I was allowed happily to make it as long and as ambitious as it is. Um, so, uh, so there are more things to write, but I think this book is what it ought to be. And do you see MLK as the... That sort of embodiment, the the secular part of him, knowing that you know, again, you yeah. also write about yeah. how his religious yeah, writings right. are right. one thing, but right. you know, do you see that sort of as the uh, as Hegel's Napoleon, basically, <laughs> as as that that figure? Um, well, I mean, who not, embodies what it could have been? Uh, I mean, not quite, I guess, because it, it's more that um, I mean, I was, once I started working seriously on on King, like. Yeah, I was amazed at how many things allowed me to think through in the book, but... Um, Is he representative of the question that you were trying to ask, or do you well, see him as something more significant? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's more significant that it has to do with what Hegel called, like, concrete universality. So it's like, it's, it's like, it's both, like, it belongs to a very concrete historical moment and concrete historical figure, but, like, uh, uh, but who embodies profound stakes of how we should understand ourselves uh, in a way that's not limited to that historical moment. So it's not simply a representative, but um, then, I mean, then it was also just really important to, because one thing that people can easily ask is that like, um, and it's a fair question, so many people who identify as religious, you know, are of course very committed activists and devoted to improving our lives here and now and so on. Uh, and, and that could seem superficially to contradict my argument that actually, like, uh, care requires secular faith rather than religious faith. But, but here's again, it's like, like, like showing that, like, in practice, all of these uh, commitments and care for our life together, for social justice, that can take the form within communities that identify as religious, showing that, like, that dynamic and those commitments don't depend on the religious beliefs, but on the on the secular faith that is implicit in it. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 the civil rights movement and King really allowed me a lot of resources to to make that argument in a way that is not just abstract in general, but very uh, very concrete. Mm -hmm. And yet, still contingent on weird little moments of history, like yeah. the show with with the Memphis strike yeah. getting derailed by a snowstorm. Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah, there are all those sense history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. That was another thing too. I mean, it was like you know, for me to 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 do the sort of historical research I did for those parts, uh, which I usually don't do, but but uh, uh, yeah, there were so many things in that historical moment that that, that came together and, and resonated with what I had been pursuing in the book. So. So last question. Uh, again, you've been in America for yeah. quite a long time now, well, at least a bunch of years. Um, do you think it would be easier to overthrow the notion of God and the afterlife yeah. or the value of capital and capital? <laughs> Which of those two seems like the less surmountable uh, 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 task? I know they're, they're implicitly tied together. Yeah, but, they're tied together, but, but uh, uh, I mean, I'll answer that in two ways. On, on one level, yes, it's easier to overcome religion than to overcome capitalism. Uh, Are you sure? Uh, well, anyway, go, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah uh, I mean, this is a longer conversation, but uh, uh, but inversely, and this is another way in which these strands come together in the book, that like concomitant with the sort of social transformation that would be required for the overcoming capitalism, the way in which that, how seriously that would require us to take our life together as the highest good, would just necessarily also require the gradual overcoming of the religious self-understanding of those people who are committed to that, even if they start out from a place where, like, you mm -hmm. think these things uh, are compatible, then just because... Uh, but if we g gradually going to come to recognize with Hegel that, like, those communal norms and values that we hold ourselves to, in one phase, we call that 
God is one name for that. But but we can we can recognize that that's actually like just a name for uh, the norms to which we hold ourselves and the uh, life together to which we're committed. You know, and 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 uh, uh, yeah. So uh, so that's why they will necessarily have to go together. Uh, but I do think on a more superficial level, it's it's easier to overcome religious belief because uh, overcome capitalism has also do have to overcome like how how we practically sustain our lives, you know. So godless socialism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Martin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Martin Haglund. His new book is This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom, out now from Pantheon. It's a fascinating book, and I hope we got that across. Um, there's a lot of compelling arguments in there about how we live and, and how we should be questioning some of the key assumptions under which we live. Now, Martin's site is martinhaglund.se, which is M-A-R-T-I-N-H-A-G-G. L-U-N-D dot S-E. It's got links to his publications, other interviews, reviews, debates, awful lot of stuff. He's also on Twitter at Martin Haglund, where Haglund is spelled H-A-E-G-G-L-U-N-D. You got to account for the umlaut somehow. He says he's got a Facebook account, so you can look him up there, too. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Martin, so who are you reading? And that turned into an interesting tangent about Heidegger. If you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The fourth quarter 2018 episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Eddie Campbell, Nora Krug, Jason Lutz, Summer Pierre, David Small, Mark Derry, Michael Gerber, Angela Himsel, Kathy B. Graham, Shahar Pinsker, and Bill Cardalopoulos. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I have all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. I recorded this episode at the Penguin Random House offices, so that was the usual George Washington Bridge toll of like 12 or 15 bucks. I think 15 because it was peak hours. Uh, $30 at my parking garage, 6 bucks for the subway. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Now, special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Lescamella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You can check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Bram Presser, author of the amazing novel, The Book of Dirt. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. 
You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMS Pod, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your friends. Tell people on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>